Alright, welcome to chapter 11. Today we'll be talking about what it means to be a critic, and then of course as an overlap of that, we'll be talking about what it means for you to critique a live theater production. Um, and as this semester goes on, I'll bring up this live theater production critique often, um, but you can write it any time in the semester. This is a major goal for the course as set out by the state um, that you see a live theater production. Once again, it needs to be at least two hours long. It needs to be professional quality. Um, you'll notice in your D2L, I have a list of links to different theaters that I recommend, such as the Tennessee Performing Arts Theater or the um, Boiler Room Theater, and these are just some places that I've personally been to and seen good work. Um, I'd rather you not see a high school show. You cannot see your third grade cousin's production of A Christmas Carol that's 20 minutes long. That's not a full theater production. This needs to be something more substantial. Um, you need to plan for this with your um, loan money that you get from the school or as part of your textbook expenses for you to go see a play. But you can do it fairly cheaply. If you go to see an MTSU play, it's eight dollars. You know, eight dollars isn't exactly gonna break the bank. If you choose to see a Tennessee Performing Arts Center piece and you pay upwards of a hundred dollars, well, um, you know, that's gonna be a great show that you'll see, um, Lord willing. But uh, the cost is part of the class, so please go ahead now. This is why we're talking about it early in the semester and set apart the time and the money to make sure you get that done. I'm also telling you because even though this is due at the end of the semester, I just want to challenge you not to put it off to the end of the semester. Um, many of you know who are returning students that around exam time a lot of us have this sort of zombie look on our face. We're sort of just going through the motions of school uh, because we have so much on our minds. So uh, get this critique out of the way. Get it chucked out. Get it done. Enjoy that live theater production while you have time to sit back and enjoy it rather than waiting till the weekend before the paper is due to go rush out and see a play somewhere. I will need you to go into some detail about you know what theater it was, um, who were the starring actors, so that it adds legitimacy to your cause. Um, I have to kind of trust you to a certain extent that you've actually gone to see this play. Um, and this is uh, a required, once again, by the state that you see a play. Um, so uh, please be honest. Don't just watch a YouTube version. Don't just watch a movie and say you saw the play. Please get out there get into a seat at a local theater and support the arts. Um, and there are some people who do this for a living. Some people who do this for a living. So we'll get into talking about them. So as you may have already discovered, I have some links there for you to Hamlet. And um, today we'll be doing some critiquing of Hamlet as sort of a case study as we talk about how to critique. Uh, Hamlet's perhaps one of the most <laughs> speculated on uh, plays of all time and rightfully so. It's very thought-provoking. Um, in your D2L links you'll find a critique of a live theater production as set out by me. Um, I have there that it has to be a certain number of pages, the font, the format that I need from you, so make sure to you know follow those guidelines, those scholastic guidelines. But then I also have a series of questions, A, B, C, D, E, F, E, and um, I'm really going to challenge you to kind of look at those probing questions that I ask you. Who are the characters? What is the style of the play? But you don't have to exhaustively sit and answer every single question. I'm asking some broad questions that may or may not relate to you. So make sure that you have a general idea about status and the choreography and such, but you don't feel like you have to exhaustively answer every question I ask because I'm just sort of trying to be thought-provoking and inch you towards your analysis by all means. Create a fully realized analysis, not just a series of answers to my questions. I give you an example of Ben Brantley. He's um, America's foremost 
critiquer. He uh, works for the New York Times, and what he says on Broadway goes. He's awesome. Um, unscathing, very very harsh, has high standards as a critic, um, so you'll want to check out some of his stuff. And then I also have uh, common mistakes down here, making sure that you're keeping the character and the actor separate, making sure that you're italicizing or putting in quotes the title of the play and such. Um, please don't just say the play was good the acting was great those have no place those comments those vague generalities have no place in an academic paper you need to be doing college level analysis not sort of these general broad sweeping um, pacifisms for me uh, you know, be specific, be specific, be specific, and proofread, please. Do you know how many papers I pick up that uh, are just completely filled with errors? Obviously, no one even bothered to finish, go back and look over to make sure that it was punctuated correctly. If you're, if you know you have a weakness for grammar. Um, please get someone else to look at your paper, a friend that you trust, or we have uh, tutors available in the Motlow website. If you want to inquire further uh, with me about tutoring, I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Dramatic analysis. Dramatic analysis. So when you were sitting in English class in eighth grade and your class read to kill a mockingbird and um, you sat down to sort of take a look at Boo Radley and who is he as a man and what has he done for us and then you examine the character of Scout and she um, has so much innocence and so much um, inquisitive nature you were doing dramatic analysis because to kill a mockingbird uh, well you may have read the novel version but it's also a play uh, and these are the sorts of things we ask in English class these are the kind of thought-provoking questions um, that are done even outside of English class after you watch a movie and you sit down and talk to the people about the movie uh, then you know that could be seen as dramatic analysis uh, on page 318 he says um, some of these questions you might ask yourself did the production hold your attention uh, did you feel involved in the action did you feel like they were good actors or did you feel like they were bad actors? Uh, was any of the content political, intellectual? Could you visualize everything based on the words that you read? Uh, all of these are good questions and right questions to ask and many of them are intuitive, something you're already doing. But So there are people in the world who are professional play readers uh, and they are called dramaturgs and the dramaturg is a uh, wear so many hats that it's almost hard to sort of summarize them. Every dramaturg I have met has been very very smart and usually uh, big in history, usually has a strong sense of um, historical style, so how theater was actually acted out during Shakespearean times for example uh, is some of the random knowledge that a dramaturg might have. But a dramaturg is also an expert at um, plotting events and knowing um, you know, uh, the denouement and understanding the resolution of the play. They're literary as well as historical. They're also often um, the ones who help the artistic director pick a play for the season. So not only does this dramaturg um, help with the play after it's already um, in process, help the director research, help the director understand the plot. Um, it, they also may be the ones picking the play in the first place along with the artistic director. Dramaturgs do so many things. They also understand theory, right? They understand those um, ways that, it ha that the actors have acted it out or the directors have staged this before and what worked and what didn't work. Uh, so they're generally just a smart person and a good person to bounce things off of. When a dramaturg comes and watches your rehearsal they're going to ask those probing questions based on their understanding of theater as a whole. So um, those are just some of things that a dramaturg might be asked to do uh, but they are experts in dramatic analysis. So a dramaturg does dramaturgy. A dramaturg does dramaturgy, so that's how you say that word. Um, and so he 
as we go in through the rest of the chapters in the book here, you'll come to see that he uses the word dramaturgy quite a lot. And he just means a holistic view of that person's analysis of the play, that person's perspective on what this play is about. So we're about to get into Hamlet. And I may think that the dramaturgy of Hamlet is all about um, depression and the sense of um, you know, we can't move when we're sad. We have no impetus to action. Uh, whereas uh, someone else might think that um, Hamlet is really about uh, royal succession and how a king may have the pressures of being a king or the pressures of being in royal court. They may think that's really what it's about. So it's kind of just um, your analysis as a verse to someone else's analysis and he uses it as a more holistic term and a more concise term than just saying their opinion right um, so uh, so we are gonna look at David Tennant's version uh, in 2008 he did it at the Nashville uh, National Shakespeare Company in, in England uh, where he's from you may recognize him from Doctor Who he uh, is not the most recent Doctor Who by the time you listen to this, he might not even be the second to the most recent Doctor Who, but he had a very successful run of um, in that sci-fi genre, and he's done other great Shakespeare works uh, in London, but this Hamlet was quite successful, so that's the one that we're going to talk about. So once again, I'm still on page 318, and we're just going to work through these different critical and dramaturgical perspectives and look at them as a lens by which to understand Hamlet. Um, if you've never uh, thought about Hamlet before in your entire life, uh, which I highly doubt, it's a very popular, very uh, widely understood play, but let me just give you some of the rundown from my perspective. Um, Hamlet is the prince of Denmark. Um, his father has been killed and his mother remarries very soon his father's brother. Um, Claudius and as soon as um, Hamlet never trusted his uncle he never trusted him and now that he's married to his mother he really doesn't trust him so then um, in the first scene that you may have already seen uh, the ghost appears of his father and um, later on in the play the ghost comes to Hamlet himself and says revenge my death uh, you know, I have been wronged, revenge my death. And so Hamlet is then put on with this huge charge of knowing that his uncle has poisoned his father and is sleeping with his mother. And there's been even more speculation here that maybe Hamlet suspects that the person who poisoned his father, the king, might actually be his father because they got married so fast it could be sort of, you know, that uh, his mother was sleeping with his uncle all along. Uh, but there's no, of course, that is part of our dramaturgy, part of our speculative nature here. Um, so then we go into Hamlet, and his um, new father, his uncle, is desperate to cheer him up because Hamlet is just walking around very, very sad. And he brings in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who are his friends, to sort of spy on him and then also, um, you know, get him out of mourning, get him cheered back up so that it doesn't put such a damper on court and of course he sees right through that and sees that um, these are fake friends and that his uncle is trying to manipulate him um, but with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern comes a company of actors who are charged to once again cheer up Hamlet and he actually has those actors act out the death of his father for his uncle to see. Of course, his uncle put poison in his ear, so it was a very specific type of um, killing. And so when the uncle sees that exact guilt, uh, the exact act of someone po pouring poison in someone's ear, uh, he gets upset and, and stands up and leaves right in the middle of the performance, um, which would have been suspect, right, which would have kind of made him look guilty. In the meantime, Hamlet is sort of putting on a sense of craziness. He's speaking in riddles, he's blabbering, he's being irrational with his girlfriend, Ophelia, 
And there's been a lot of, once again, dramaturgy around this. Was he being crazy with Ophelia? Does he tell her to go to a nunnery because he knows that he's probably going to die trying to kill his uncle and he doesn't want to hurt her? Uh, does he just get distracted and not interested in his girlfriend anymore? Um, he obviously shows regret after she actually goes mad and drowns herself. Um, and he feels bad uh, that the, that series of events have happened. Um, some of the famous moments in this play, uh, to be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, but even more so, um, <laughs> it's kind of funny to think about, uh, Ophelia's father is actually sort of a bumbling idiot and he rambles on too much. And some of his lines have actually been credited to Shakespeare as some of the wisdom of Shakespeare when actually, um, uh, they're actually written as sort of ramblings. Do not a borrower or a lender be some of those, um, you know, that have become iconic as Shakespeare quotes were actually part of just what he would have considered nonsense rambling. <laughs> uh, so um, how does Hamlet end? Everybody's dead. <laughs> That's pretty much the way it ends. Uh, you know, the mother, uh, is drinks a poisoned glass. Um, Hamlet is stabbed with a poisoned sword, uh, and Hamlet stabs his uncle. And the the stage is just littered with bodies, which is almost always the way that these tragedies end. When we get into talking about genres, you'll see um, that almost all of these tragedies end. Now there are some major plot points I'm leaving out here, such as the pirates and, uh, you know, boarding a ship and turning around and all of that business, uh, and not to mention the invading troops at the end, right? This was always a concern. If a king showed any kind of weakness, if a queen showed any sort of weakness in her realm, it was, you know, going to be attacked by someone else who was going to be opportunistic and pounce on their weakness, uh, which is part of the reason it was so important that the royalty keep up a sense of grandeur and importance. Um, so Hamlet is a very poetic piece of work. Oh, what a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. Um, and it's very vague. So we, uh, have these conversations about Hamlet, um, about death, about pain, um, perhaps even more importantly on a personal note, we know that Shakespeare had a son who died whose name was Hamnet, and so he changed that name slightly in writing this, but he was one of a pair of twins, and he died, um, and the play is overwhelmingly about death and grief, and in this sleep of death what dreams may come when we have suffered off this mortal toil must give us pause, and, and we ask ourselves, uh, you know, how do we handle death, the death of a loved one, do we, how do we handle the injustice that comes with death, often somebody dies for no good reason and for a reason that's not really worthy. Um, and remember, in this time, it's hard to overstate the, the importance of uh, the throne in general. Everybody was affected by the person in power. You know, if the president wants to bomb China tomorrow, he has to talk to Congress. He's got to get, um, you know, he has to have some sort of group mentality because we live in a democracy. Well, the king back then could just say, you know, I don't really like Protestants and put all the Protestants to death. And then the next king could say, you know what? I don't really like Catholics. Let's kill all the Catholics. And it was on their whim. It was on their emotional bearings or who was influencing their mind that entire policies for the nation and nations to come are founded on. So uh, when he tells these stories about kings, you know, the, his audience, Shakespeare's audience would have known that the lives or deaths of thousands were hanging in the balance. So uh, I had you watch the very first clip um, just to kind of give you a sense of some of the theatrical conventions that are being utilized here. So uh, this is the scene in th the first clip where the ghost is walking through. And then when we switch to the video camera, you can see that there is no ghost. But then when it switches back into the regular view of the, the camera, uh, the 
you know it's not black and white anymore it's in color we see that there are there is a ghost in front of them so remember when we talked about postmodernity and the idea of perspective and is it real or not real remember the biggest question about postmodernity oh, we actually might not have talked about most postmodernity yet but we will <laughs> the on, the ontology the question here is a question of being what is real what is not real and so the video camera is sort of um, a touchstone for us that you know really there's not a person walking through but to the perspective of the people on the ground they're seeing a ghost the ghost is there and real for them and either they are mass hallucinating or that temporal spirit is not captured by a video camera um, so there's a couple important kind of things here there's a certain self-consciousness that that brings Hamlet's a very paranoid character if we're sp gonna speculate about the mental health of Hamlet he's very paranoid and uh, and so these cameras kind of help bring that into a perspective and as you watch if you were to watch the entire David Tennant Hamlet you will see him referring back to those cameras and cursing the cameras and a sense of police state about the whole business so I think it's the camera uh, in far, as far as concept is really I think an impressive use of updating a classical piece of course in the original this isn't part of Shakespeare Shakespeare didn't know what a camera was <laughs> right uh, but Shakespeare had definitely that sense of maybe what all royalty feel that they are under the microcosm that they're under the limelight and everybody is watching their every move and once again everybody's watching their every move because their decisions affect everybody else's life so the first sort of um, thing we have going on on page 318 is social significance social significance how does the play that you go see whether it be something not that controversial of social issues like um, you know big Broadway musical like Wicked or Lion King right there's not a whole lot of scathing oh all the Republicans are ruining America kind of uh, sort of commentary to it but almost all plays have if not a vague and sometimes very pointed political agenda uh, you know and your book rightly points out that many many theaters are partially if not fully funded by the government uh, not so much in America the NEA the National Endowment for the Arts has really cut back on our funding and there's you know maybe Lincoln Center but not a lot of public funding uh, for the arts but if you go to a town in Germany any town in Germany there's going to be a community center there where plays are put on um, and that is all government funded Canada has some great uh, public theaters uh, national theaters um, and he actually goes through in chapter 10 and talks about some of the national theaters around the world so if you're interested if you're planning a visit to Austria by all means refer back to chapter 10 and see some of those government funded remember we talked about ancient Greece the um, In ancient Greece, the wealthy taxpayers could either fund a play or a boat, but that was part of their taxes, their duty to the government in a whole. Um, when we get into the royal theater, it was in England, it was altogether paid by the monarchy. Um, medieval theater, remember, is told through the eyes of the church and funded by the church often, or the guilds, right, if they uh, would financially support it but it was usually in some way whether it was someone's tithe or the church directly those plays were put on and sponsored by uh, and he who pays the piper you know calls the shot there <laughs> they, they get to name the tune uh, so a, a lot of theaters are not going to have scathing political uh, viewpoints if they're partially funded by the government or else they will be shut down or the government will not give them the money they need next year so um, it's interesting also that they bring up the point of propaganda and we talk about the Beijing Opera we'll talk about this more but good theater says every side of an issue they don't just 
paint a one-sided picture, a false picture, and then present it as the truth. Um, that's called propaganda. For example, Hitler used propaganda films in World War II um, showing and comparing Jewish people to rats, for example, and those posters and those films um, were used to sort of fuel the hatred and the anti-Semitism. Um, uh, but there are many social issues. He lists some of them here. Alcoholism, civil equality, military excess. So in Shakespeare's day, what did he mean to be the social issue in Hamlet? Um, well, remember at this time, there was quite a bit of um, censorship. All of the plays had to be viewed by a representative of the Queen, and they would be not allowed to be presented if the Queen's censor thought that they were not sufficient. So we had to be much more subtle. They couldn't just stand up and say, long live the Queen. It needed to be quite a bit more subtle. And almost all of Shakespeare's works are in some way going to suck up to royalty. For example, Macbeth was written to please uh, King James because he was obsessed with druids and witchcraft. Um, and Mary Wives of Windsor was dedicated to Queen Elizabeth and it has got women in it who are witty and clever and strong as Queen Elizabeth was. But um, in what way does Hamlet attribute to Queen Elizabeth? Well, we have to have a little history lesson here. Remember, Queen Elizabeth was a tutor. She was the daughter of King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Uh, her mother was killed shortly after, beheaded by the king himself, accused, uh, trumped up charges of, um, well, we can only assume, we can't really know if she actually cheated on her husband or not, Anne Boleyn, but she, uh, was his second wife and she was uh, publicly uh, excommunicated and publicly beheaded. And then Elizabeth for a while lost her su succession to the throne based on the idea that she might e not even be Henry VIII's child. So this idea of succession, the idea of um, who deserves to be king or queen was a big deal for Elizabeth and was always in the forefront of her mind. Um, we know her sister um, was imprisoned because she was so afraid that her sister was going to come into power and uh, take back over the Catholic rule. So uh, in some ways we can assume that Hamlet's family problems in as a royal person and his w spite and vengeance towards his uncle would have been something that Elizabeth probably would have felt pretty closely. Um, you know, she and Mary always had a tumultuous relationship. Uh, Elizabeth and her father had a tumultuous relationship. And so that sort of um, poisoning and um, question of guilt or in what way is is everyone here being honest or are we just putting on a show for our subjects would have probably pretty uh, much resonated with Elizabeth as a tutor and all of the drama that Henry VIII had. It's pretty uh, pretty easy to see. Um, and, and also a lot of the people of the day would have had questions about political corruption and who should be in power. Remember the Catholics really wanted Mary to be in power, the Protestants wanted Elizabeth to be in power, so um, the, the question of does this person deserve to be in power was a pertinent one in that day. And while it is a very subtle message, remember in order for it to get past the uh, censor, it would have to be subtle. It would have to be subtle. So, okay, so moving away from the sense of social issues and into human significance. So, your book defines human significance as sort of looking to the universal uh, truths, kind of similar to hope so we're looking to universal truths. We're looking to hopes, concerns, conflicts of humankind, identity, courage, um, kindness, love, all of these sort of universally human questions. Um, and this is probably what Hamlet is most famous for. He has these beautiful soliloquies where he asks questions like, and then does not conscience make a cowards of us all, right? Um, deep questions about our own 
um, humanity and how we wrestle with our own thoughts. And there's been so much dramaturgy around this one speech, to be or not to be. Um, and part of that is that it is vague, right? To be, does he mean to live, to act, to, you know, what exactly does it mean to be or not to be? Obviously, there is a sense of looming death. Um, and when he says uh, what dreams may come, he is questioning uh, spirituality in general. Now, because of the same sense of censorship, he was not allowed to say God on stage. Uh, if you hear Shakespeare say, by Jove, uh, he doesn't actually believe in the Roman God, Jove, he just can't say by God. Uh, because at that time there was so much tension between the different sects of um, religion that they couldn't have open discussions in public without mass rioting. So. Uh, these questions of is it uh, better to sluff, suffer the slings and arrows you know all of this hardship that we have in our lives um, is it worth it and at the time almost everyone Catholic and Protestant alike would have felt um, that suicide was gonna send you straight to hell so what Hamlet may have been struggling with was a sense of should I kill myself? Is it even worth it to kill this man and know that I'll probably die in the process and you know have the woman in my life suffer through that or you know is it better for me to just kill myself and put an end to all of this uh, questioning um, and go and be with my father right? It might have been a big uh, thought in his mind but uh, there's undoubtedly a human being dealing with real problems here and uh, the poetry of it, the philosophy of it, the musings that go on, uh, this is often my favorite part of any play is the humanity of it. Uh, C.S. Lewis, one of his students famously said, we read to know we are not alone. We read to know we are not alone. And I would dare to say I go to the theater sometimes <laughs> to know that I'm not alone. Because when we all laugh at the same jokes or nod earnestly at the same truths, then we feel a sense of togetherness and understand that our problems are often universal. And um, there's no reason to suffer in silence in our own pain knowing that other people feel the same. Artistic quality, artistic quality. So, um, how, when you go see your play, is it pretty, right? Are it, do you like Cinderella's big pretty dress? Do you like the chandelier in Phantom of the Opera? Do you like um, the way that they had their hair styled? Uh, you know, in some simple way, beauty is why we go to the theater to enjoy something beautiful, whether it's the beautiful poetry or the beautiful ideas or the beautiful stuff on stage. There's got to be a sense of something being beautiful. Now, of course, if Grotowski heard me say that, he would turn over in his grave because he thought that things should be ugly and grotesque and ch change our convictions. I mean, I think there's a, a point to that, too, but overall, was it pleasing? right? The artistic quality. Did it make sense? Could you understand it? Was the acting credible? Um, was it logical? Uh, and this moment in Hamlet that I bring you to is very, very famous. Hamlet's advice to the players or Hamlet's advice to the actors. Um, and he's just telling those actors how he wants them to act. And that kind of brings up this speculative nature of art. What I find pretty, you know, my favorite color is blue your favorite color might not be blue. You might not think it's pretty. Um, and so everybody has their own sense of what beauty is. But uh, Hamlet's advice to the players is based pretty seethingly on Shakespeare's own experience at the time. He had recently fired one of his actors, William Kemp, because he was a jokester and he would disrupt and upstage. He would make jokes that weren't in the script and he was pleasing. Some people were laughing, but meanwhile some necessary element of the plot, as he says, is suffering. So um, that's personal and then of course he's also just telling his actors in this quick rehearsal time that they had how he thought they should act right they shouldn't saw the air too much in other words they don't need to have these hand gestures that are flailing everywhere 
They need to fit the word to the action and the action to the word. So they need to act out with their entire body, not just with their voice. Um, and this is just some of the things that he thinks Shakespeare, and he's using Hamlet as a mouthpiece for what uh, artistic qualities he prefers. So relationship to the theater itself. Remember, theater is always a magic act. It's always a construct. It's always a question of how are we going to make this look and tell this story? Are we going to use flats or are we going to use real scenery? Are we going to use costumes or are we going to put them in their regular clothes? Um, and even, you know, are we going to let time pass? The playwright kind of detect this too you know we're gonna let time pass or are we gonna just do it in real time in a two-hour show all of these sort of um, theatrical convention questions come up when we talk about um, defining this piece of theater in terms of other pieces of theater because theater will always be its own ruler you know uh, by ruler I don't mean king I mean by ruler that little wooden thing you used to use in elementary school to have straight lines. Um, it measures uh, itself, but then other things then become measured by it. So David Tennant has now done a new Hamlet. Well, Mel Gibson's Hamlet will forever be compared to David Tennant's Hamlet, and rightly so. That's how it goes. Laurence Olivier's Hamlet back in the 50s is now going to be compared to David Tennant's Hamlet. So we judge theater in relations to itself, but then we also have a phenomenon called meta theater, where we have plays within a play, or uh, we have a rehearsal going on within the play. So it's sort of um, admitting the contrived nature of what we're experiencing. And Hamlet's is one of the most favorite, uh, famous meta theater experiences. So in this scene, as you saw, uh, Hamlet has charged this acting troupe to act out the death of his father by his uncle and uh, it works. The mouse trap works. It catches the mouse. As soon as he sees him pour that poison into his ear, um, the, his uncle can't stand it. He gets up and walks out and it uh, sufficiently convicts him of his crime. So when you go see a play, you need to ask yourself, are they using all the theatrical conventions that other musical theater you know, plays are using? Is this something like I've never seen before? Uh, does this remind you of another kind of theater or movie that you've seen before? No art form occurs in a vacuum. So uh, theater is a product of its culture, it's a product of other theater, and um, you need to be able to see the play through the eyes of other plays. Part of that is just making sure that you know your history. Entertainment value. <laughs> I guess it's sort of strange for me to have that skull there in front of him and call it entertainment. Uh, most people don't think of death as entertaining, but I, I kind of intentionally put that juxtaposition there because entertainment does not always mean jazz hands and tap routines. Sometimes it means um, provoking thoughts, you know, talking about the grotesque or talking about the exotic or bringing up the... Um, so sometimes it's funny because it's biting. Sometimes we enjoy it because it's exotic or grand, right? Um, it can, something can be arresting or hold our attention. The word entertainment means that which holds the attention. Um, so, you know, we may be amused by a dead bird on the sidewalk and we may just sit and look at it for a second because it's gross or weird. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's grand or beautiful, but it does mean that it's entertaining. It, it, it catches our attention. And a lot of theater is based off this, you know, the, the theater of the grotesque. Uh, you know, you're going to watch if someone's being tortured. Sometimes we're, we're tempted to peek and look because we have a morbid curiosity. It's not just, it's not just all uh, lights and camera and, and glitter and glam. Um, but I do think that this graveyard scene, uh, it's obviously very famous motif. We've seen many different actors holding a skull in their hand representing Hamlet. And it's a beautiful moment of Hamlet reflecting on the mortality of the fool, the jester, the jokester in his court, who we often gave him piggyback rides. And now he's dead. And... Uh, you know, this obviously is a reflection on his own father's death, and he knows he's going to die soon. He knows that by challenging the king, he 
is ending his own uh, life because he, he, he knows he won't survive that. I, I really enjoy on page 322 he talks about theater stimulates us intellectually um, you know it's socially exciting it's romantic often it rescues us from our internet internet it rescues us from our intellectual and emotional aloneness and I just think that's a great way of saying it um, many of us have thought about what's it gonna be like to die what's uh, you know what is the afterlife gonna be like I wonder where my relatives are or what they're doing right now and so this beautiful universal picture of contemplating death through a prop through you know a skull there I think is very poignant at least for my experience all right, so um, David Tennant did this role at the um, Nash National Shakespeare Company, and uh, when he performed it on stage, The Guardian gave it good reviews, said it was the best Hamlet of our time. He had some interesting adjectives, and this is the kind of thing that I want from you. I don't want you to just tell me it was good, right? He was funny. I really love the when you can be more descriptive than that. He was preening, right? That is a very uh, sensory word, preening. Help me to pretend that I was there with you. Recreate it. Paint those pictures for me, specifically what it was like, that theatrical experience. Um, don't just say it was boring, right? Well, tell me how it was boring. Did the scene draw out? Was the actor taking too many pauses? Was the furniture not being moved quickly enough? Give me lots of detail. Um, newspaper critics are um, a huge part of the theatrical machine, believe it or not. If a critic says that a play is good, then a lot of people trust them and go out to see more plays. If you'd like to see a Tennessee version of this, the Nashville scene has um, a great series of uh, critics, if you want to check out their website, who do critiques of local performances. Um, if you know that the Nashville scene is going to observe the play you're, you plan to see, maybe you want to take a moment to look at that and um, compare or quote them in your own paper and say, I agree with this or I don't agree or he said this really well. Remember, we don't want to have too many quotes from other people. I do want to know your opinion, but it might be insightful for you to read what somebody else has critiqued or even of an, another version, right? If you go see Hamlet in Nashville, um, you know, without David Tennant, with a different actor, maybe it might help you to read this full critique and say, you know, I think that this Hamlet might have been different from David Tennant's Hamlet. All of these nice, specific uh thoughtful deep reflections are purposeful and much better than it was a good play uh, okay so literary critics and we're not talking about David Tennant's performance anymore of Hamlet we're talking about Hamlet as a play as something that Shakespeare wrote down um, a lot of us uh, enjoy reading these plays and sort of speculating on them and as you know Nietzsche was a very famous philosopher um, I'm going to take a minute to read this because I feel like it's a little bit dense and I need to unpack it for you. Knowledge kills action. Action requires the veils of illusion. So what does he mean by that? Action requires the veils of illusion. So if we look at something like the Crusades, um, right, the uh, Muslim uh, nations invading a Christian nation and killing off all the Christians, or vice versa, the Christian nation invading the Muslim nation and killing off all the Muslims. And a lot of them were doing that from a place of uh, limited knowledge right they were doing what someone else told them to do they were taking orders and they didn't really have to sit back and think hmm I wonder if that other person is a human being or hmm I wonder if they have children uh, you know the picture painting for them is go kill the heathens uh, you know the Spanish Inquisition go torture the heathens until they become uh, to our side and when you see things so simply when you have a nice black and white structure you don't have to worry about the intricacies of the doctrine you don't have to worry about the um, the unclearness right and and so what he's saying is knowledge kills action right it's much harder for some to uh, put someone in the electric chair 
if they know all of the intricacies about uh, their psychological health at the time for example you know if they had some sort of insanity going on do, do we still need to kill them it, life or death becomes much more of a gray area rather than the black and white um, and so what Nietzsche is saying is that Hamlet understood the situation fully he understood the flaws of his own father. He understood the nature of Claudius and how the, th the throne is often usurped. There's often someone killing someone else off. Um, he understood his mother might have really been in love with Claudius. And so if, if he were to kill his own uncle, um, first of all, that's you know his own blood. He's killing someone of his own blood. But then he's also killing uh, the, the man that his mother loves. Not many of us would kill our stepfather even if uh, we hated him just because out of respect for our mother. So Hamlet, he wasn't just someone who was sitting around dreaming and paralyzed by his own indecision, uh, as he says, you know, cheap wisdom of Jack the Dreamer, but he is truly knowledgeable. He really fully understands the situation and doesn't want to act because he understands the truth of it right now eventually he gets over that he gets over the truth of it and how his mother might feel because the justice the injustice of the situation weighs too heavily on hamlet's heart he has to avenge his father particularly because he came back and you know not corporal form to tell him that which is not good uh you know might have just been scared that the ghost was gonna kill him if he didn't kill claudius so um i think nietzsche uh is doing what I call an ink blot. <laughs> uh, you know, and there's a, a book in the library window, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank. And it's true that we treat Anne Frank like an ink blot. We treat Hamlet like an ink blot. Uh, the ink blots were made famous um, by Freud, I think. Uh, and the idea was just to splatter some ink, you know, fold the paper, unfold it, and then ask somebody, what does this look like to you? Right? Some of us do this when we lay on our backs and look at the clouds. What does that look like to you? Oh, that's a bunny rabbit. Well, to my little nephew, he's obsessed with bunny rabbits right now. So everything looks like a bunny rabbit. Uh, and the same is true, I would say, for Nietzsche. Right? Everything was about true knowledge. So of course he's going to look at Hamlet and say it's about true knowledge. Um, and when we ask ourselves, what do these characters represent? Uh, often it's like looking at an ink blot and your own perspective, your own relationship with your father, your own relationship to death is going to come out when we talk about Hamlet because we're talking about existence and life and vague generalities and we all have our own perspectives on that uh, so critics can sometimes tell them themselves and if you would like to share something personal in your live production critique to me um, you know well this reminded me of something that happened in my own life well in some ways that makes that play very very successful that it's hit a nerve with you that it's resonated with you on something deep and emotional and psychological um, I'm not asking you to bear your soul I'm just saying it's okay that it's subjective. It's okay that that father reminds me of you, your father. Uh, you know, that is the nature of criticism, is that it is personal. All right, so we're done with Hamlet. Whew. I hope that you were able to follow me. I know I was going off on quite a few directions. It's a well-bodied, full discussion that we sort of had to skim over there. So um, if you would love to talk about Hamlet, I would love to talk about Hamlet with you. Let's get together and watch David Tennant and his brilliant performance of Hamlet. But moving on, we are the critics. Uh, the show must go on. So you as a critic, let's talk about you as a critic. The first thing you need to do is you need to come in with a certain amount of open-mindedness. If you have a bad day, if you stump your toe and lose your lunch money, don't go to the theater and then write me a scathing critique. Go to the theater in a fairly good mood. Be receptive. Expect the best of the people. Um, you know, Look forward to it. If it's a show that you're not looking forward to, pick a different show. Right? You hopefully live in an area where there's enough theater that you can be choosy be choosy uh, but go into it with an open mind now as we go through some of these advice that I'm giving you some of you will be better at some things than others right some of us have a natural personality that we're open-minded and we're open to new experiences um, that's like on my personality profile <laughs> open to new experiences um, 
So be informed. Do your homework before you go see the show. Don't wait till after the show to go look up uh, who the author was or what the production's about. Sit down for a minute at Google, right? There's no excuse in the information age for you not to have some prior knowledge before you walk in and the curtain goes up. Um, some things that you might want to look at is the historical context of the play. If you go see Camelot, what was King Arthur and who was he? And um, how does the legend of that live on in England? Uh, if you go... Um, to the theater, right? What theater are you going to? If you go to um, the Boiler Room Theater, what kind of play do they usually do? What other kind of reviews have it has it gotten? Um, even if you know the actor who's going to be in the play, what was their training? Are they more classically trained? Are they more of a gymnast? What you know? What is their skill level? So go into the theater experience already knowing a little bit about the context uh, of the playwright. I didn't mention the playwright. That's really important. He's the one or she's the one really telling you the story. So look up their biography. Um, I had so many students uh, who saw a Jason Robert Brown play and they turned in their critique and um, I was so proud of them that they had done their work and knew that Jason Robert Brown himself was Jewish and that when he wrote 13 he was basically telling his autobiographical story of him moving to a different town. So I think um, if you look into the playwright himself sometimes it's autobiographical and that can help inform and understand the context. Context is key. So by sensitive he really means humble. <laughs> Uh, here's what happens in the theater a lot. It's like watching the Olympics. <laughs> and I think I used this example somewhere else in your lectures, but I'll say it again. I sit on the couch, and the first time that I watch an Olympic athlete jump off a diving board, I'm like, wow, that is beautiful. Oh, my goodness. And then by the third time, somebody, I'm like, uh-uh, he's not doing it right. <laughs> And then I go to my apartment complex pool and belly flop into the water because I don't know how to dive like that. And it can kind of be like that in theater. It is, if it's, if it looks easy, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy. Uh, the best artists are the best art conceals art. So I'll, I'll talk about this more when we get into the design chapter, but um, just because it looked easy doesn't mean it was easy. So have a certain amount, amount of humility walking into the experience. Know that um, you know that tap dance, may while it might have looked easy, it really took a lot of um, physical exertion. Uh, while those words coming out of their mouth might have seemed um, trippingly to glide across their tongue. It probably took them hours and hours and hours to memorize those lines. So give them the benefit of the doubt. Remember that, uh, you know, what would you look like up there if you were trying to do the same thing that they're doing? It is easy to be a critic in some senses. It's easy to sit back and say, um, you know, that guy should have ran faster. <laughs> Well, what's your speed? That's kind of where we're going with that. So um, be kind, be gentle, understand that theater is harder than it looks, and um, don't be too smug or inhumane about the experience, which most of you want. I've, I've, I've learned in my years of reading critiques, most of you will be overly generous. Uh, you will not be mean enough, uh, which gets us to our fourth point here. You need to have high standards. If something bothers you, please don't play pretty sweet southern girl and say, it was just fine, it was okay, it wasn't that bad. No, you need to tell me. They're not going to read this critique. Tell me the truth. I need to know that you have a scholastic eye and are discerning enough to know what worked and what didn't. So don't be afraid to give at least one criticism. In fact, I'm going to demand you give me at least one criticism. And this doesn't mean that you are, you know, the nitpicking you know don't if someone went up on a line at one moment you know you don't necessarily have to record that like you're the police you're giving an account but there could be some open things that just didn't work for you right and I need to know that what didn't work for you I want you to be all these things no pressure <laughs> and then I'm also just glad to see you supporting a theater 
uh, adventure. Even if the money you feel like was wasted, the show was horrible, just think that people are trying art and this may be their therapy. This may be the thing that gets them up in the morning or gets them excited. Um, and they may not have been the best actor or actress, but it's it's meaningful to them. And just the investment of the three or six months of their life that they spend in the rehearsal process attests to the fact that it's meaningful for them. And they need supporters. They need fans on the local level. They need your money <laughs> in order to keep doing what they love. And so um, Anton Chekhov famously said um, that we will fail. <laughs> right? Um, but stubbornly, fanatically find your own way. And I, as an artist, can tell you, I've been in some bad plays. And, and I had to do about five plays before I found my play. And so there is some bad theater out there, but hopefully you don't too get too angry about what you feel like was wasted ticket sales, just knowing that it was meaningful. What you supported, good or bad, was a meaningful experience for those involved not to sugarcoat it too much. Okay, so dramaturge. What is, who is a dramaturge and what is the art of dramaturgy? Uh, like I said before, it is a lot of things. It is a critic, right? Um, Mr. Lessing here, he uh, was the in-house critic. He would kind of historically document the plays and how they went and how they were received by the public. Um, and, and they're a historian for the Playhouse as well as a historian to help tell what the play uh, you know he was working on these Shakespeare plays telling them what the history behind the play was dramaturgs were not uh, a big deal in the theater until you know the last 20 30 years uh, partially because theaters are so underfunded <laughs> we don't need to add any more support staff we're just trying to pay the actors and the designers let alone anybody else but it really does take some of the pressure off of the um, director to have a dramaturg there and also the artistic director who's often held up in a lot of business side of theater you may not even think about the fact that the theater is a business and all of the things that go into entrepreneurship and advertising and um, all of the normal maintaining of a business happen in the theater and so a lot of people who would like maybe to do the work of the dramaturg is actually out there as artistic director um, you know shaking hands and kissing babies trying to get people to come in to see the plays so um, a lot of the support staff has is accredited to the commercial nature of the way that theater has become um, so as I said before the dramaturg may help pick out what plays go in the season now officially that's the artistic director's job but the dramaturg may suggest or help working on remember I said the events of the play being able to read the literature and then apply it um, and make sure that those events are coming through on stage uh, one of the worst things that can happen in a play is you know somebody was supposed to get stabbed but somehow in the blocking or in the uh, choreographing that fight scene it just doesn't get clear to the audience and so the dramaturg may help the events unfold rationally and make sure that they're Put together and then as I've said already the dramaturg is the smart guy who knows how it actually was back there and can keep everything straight and then um, as Lessing was a critic of his own theater um, so many of these dramaturgs give a sound bite to the audience and let them know you know summarize the play for them as a fellow audience member it's hard for us as the directors or the actors sometimes to pitch it to the audience because it's so close to heart and it's so many things whereas the dramaturg can sometimes um, give a more objective viewpoint so I'm so glad that you'll be a dramaturg with me this semester and we can speculate and we can get to know each other better by learning each other's perspectives. I hope that you can feel open and honest enough in the online environment to share your true feelings and your true thoughts with me. I consider that a privilege and I don't take it lightly. Thank you for listening.